Chapter 73 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Chapter 73 the shining child and the wicked moosh how the rich cousins came once upon a time a noble but poor count lived in the lovely land of alsace he dwelt in a charming little house on a hill all around the house the graceful trees stretched out their leafy branches like arms as if they were saying welcome welcome among us not far from the house was a thick green wood filled with birds and flowers and scented grasses the good count did not live alone in this delightful spot no indeed his wife and his two children fanchon and frederic lived with him happy and contented now one summer the news arrived that a wealthy and distinguished nobleman cousin of the count was coming the next day with his family to call upon his poor relatives the following morning the countess got up very early and baked a cake into which she put more almonds and raisins than she ever put into her easter cakes so that its delicious fragrance filled the house the count dusted and brushed his old green waistcoat while fanchon and frederic dressed in their best clothes sat waiting for the guests to come you must not run about in the wood as you usually do said the count to them but sit very still so that you will look clean and neat when your cousins arrive so the poor children were forced to stay in the house the morning sun was peeping bright and smiling from behind a cloud and was darting his rays in at the window out in the wood the breeze was blowing sweet and fresh and the robins the thrushes the goldfinches and the nightingales were all warbling their loveliest songs poor fanchon sat still and listened sometimes smoothing the bow on her pink sash sometimes knitting a bit and all the while longing to run away to the wood as for frederic he was looking at a picture book but he kept jumping up every minute to gaze out at the window for the big house-dog pepin was barking and bounding before the window as if to say aren't you coming out what in the world are you doing in that stuffy room and so fanchon and frederic had to remain in the house and this was all the more painful because the company cake which was on the table gave out the most delicious spicy odors yet might not be cut until the cousins came oh that they would only come would only come the children cried and almost wept with impatience at last the loud tramping of horses was heard and the rumble of wheels then a carriage approached so brilliant and so covered with golden ornaments that the children were amazed for they had never seen anything like it the carriage stopped before the house and a very tall thin gentleman glided out with the help of a footman and fell into the arms of the count to whose cheek he gently pressed his lips then the footman aided a stout red-faced woman to alight while two children a boy and a girl stepped languidly down after her when they were all safely in the house Fanchon and Frederic came forward and curtsied politely as their father had told them to do. Then each seized a hand of the tall gentleman, saying, We are glad you are come, noble cousin, after which they permitted the red-faced lady to embrace them. Then they went up to the children, but stood before them silent and amazed. Indeed, these rich children were wonderfully dressed the boy wore a little jacket of scarlet cloth embroidered with gold and ornamented with gold tassels a bright little sword hung at his side on his head was a curious red cap with a white feather from under which peeped his yellow face and bleared eyes the little girl had on a white dress all ribbons lace and bows and her hair was frizzled and curled into a knot on top of which was a shining coronet 
Fanchon plucked up her courage and was going to take the little girl's hand, but she snatched it away in such a hurry and looked so tearful and angry that Fanchon was frightened and let her alone. Frederic wished to have a closer look at the boy's sword, and put out his hand to touch it, when the youngster began to shout and cry, "'My sword! My sword! He's going to take my sword!' and ran to his father and hid behind him. After that Fanchon and Frederic stood back quietly while their mother cut the cake, and the older people talked. The two rich children sat munching dry crackers, for their parents said that cake was not good for them but fanchon and frederic each had a large slice which their dear mother gave them after they had finished eating the guests arose to say good-bye and the glittering carriage was driven to the door the footman took from it two large bandboxes these the rich children handed with condescending pride to fanchon and frederic and just as the guests were about to take their leave, the big dog Pepin, Frederic's faithful friend and darling, came dancing and barking around them. The rich children screamed and had to be lifted, kicking with fright, into the carriage, which immediately drove away. So ended the visit of these wealthy and distinguished noble cousins. THE NEW PLAYTHINGS after the carriage containing the wealthy cousins had rolled down the hill, the Count threw off his green waistcoat and put on his loose jacket and ran his fingers through his hair. The children, too, quickly got out of their best clothes and felt light and happy. "'To the wood! To the wood!' shouted Frederic, jumping as high as he could for joy. "'But don't you wish to see what is in these handsome bandboxes your cousins gave you?' asked their mother." And Fanchon, who had been gazing at the bandboxes with longing eyes, cried out, "'Can't we open them first and go to the wood afterward?' But Frederic was hard to convince. "'Surely that stupid boy could not have brought anything worth while,' said he scornfully, "'nor his ribbony sister. He talked so boldly about bears and lions, but when my dear Pepin barked, he forgot his sword and hid under the table. A brave sportsman, he!' "'Oh, dear good brother,' cried Fanchon, "'just let us take one peep at what is in the boxes.' So Frederic, who always did what he could to please his sister, gave up the idea of being off to the wood at once, and sat down patiently beside the table where the band-boxes were. The mother opened them. And then— Oh, my dear readers, if you could have seen what lay within, the loveliest toys were in those boxes, and candies, and sweet cakes, and nuts. The children clapped their hands again and began crying, Oh, how nice! Oh, how delicious! They took them all out of the boxes and piled them on the table. None of the toys caused Frederic such satisfaction as did a little hunter, who, when a string that stuck out from his jacket was pulled, put a gun to his shoulder and fired at a target. Next to him, in Frederic's affections, was a little fellow who bowed and twanged on a harp whenever Frederic turned a tiny handle, and what pleased him nearly as much was a shotgun made of wood and a hunting pouch and belt. Fanchon was equally delighted with a beautiful doll, a trunk filled with doll's dresses, tiny shoes, hats, and other lovely clothes, and a set of charming doll's furniture. The children forgot all about the wood, and enjoyed themselves with their playthings until quite late in the evening. Then they went to bed and slept soundly. What Happened to the Playthings in the Wood the next morning the children got their boxes and took out the playthings and began to play then just as on the day before the sun shone brightly in at the windows the trees rustled in the breeze and the birds sang their loveliest songs at last frederic cried out why do we sit here in this stuffy room i'll tell you what we'll do come fanchon let us be off to the wood fanchon had just undressed her doll and was going to put it to bed "'Why can't we stay here?' she begged, and play a little longer, Frederic. "'I'll tell you what we'll do,' he replied. "'We'll take our toys out to the wood. "'I'll put on my pouch and belt and carry my gun. "'I'll be a real sportsman. "'The hunter and the harper may come, too, and you may take your doll.' 
Come along, let us be off. Fanchon hastened to dress her doll. Then they both ran out of the house and off to the wood. There they sat down on a nice grassy spot, and after they had played a while, Fanchon said, Do you know, Frederic, that harper of yours does not play very well. Just listen how funny his harp sounds out here in the wood with that eternal ting, ting, ping, ping. Frederic turned the handle more violently. You're right, Fanchon, said he. What the little fellow plays sounds quite horrible. He must make a better job of it. And with that he unscrewed the handle with such force that, crack, crack, the box on which the harper stood flew into a thousand splinters, and the arms of the little fellow were broken and hung useless at his sides. Oh, oh, cried Frederic. Ah, the poor little harper, sighed Fanchon. "'Well, he was a stupid creature,' said Frederick. "'He played very poor music, and bowed, and made faces like our yellow-faced cousin who gave him to us. And as Frederick spoke, he threw the harper into a thicket. "'What I like is my hunter,' he continued. "'He hits the bull's-eye every time he fires, and with that Frederick jerked the string so violently that, twang, twang, the target was broken, and the little man's arms hung limp and motionless.' ah uh, ah uh, cried frederick you could shoot at your target indoors but out here you can't shoot at all and so saying frederick with all his might shied the hunter after the harper into the thicket come let us run about a bit said he to fanchon ah yes let us said she this lovely doll of mine shall run with us it shall be great fun so Fanchon and Frederic each took an arm of the doll, and off they ran through the bushes, on and on, until they came to a small lake, and there they stopped. And Frederic said, "'Suppose we wait a minute. I have a gun now, and perhaps I may hit a duck among the rushes.' At that moment Fanchon screamed out, "'Oh, just look at my doll! What's the matter with her?' Indeed, the poor thing was in a miserable condition." neither fanchon nor frederic had been paying any attention to her and the bushes had torn all the clothes off her back both her legs were broken and her pretty waxen face was covered with so many scratches that it was hideous to look at oh my beautiful beautiful child sobbed fanchon there you see what a stupid creature that doll of yours is cried frederic she can't even take a little run but she must tear and spoil her clothes give her to me and before Fanchon could say a word or cry, Oh, oh, Frederic snatched the doll and flung her into the lake. Never mind, Fanchon, he said consolingly. Never mind. If I can shoot a duck, you shall have the most beautiful wing feathers. Just then a noise was heard among the rushes, and Frederic instantly took aim with his wooden gun, but he dropped it quickly from his shoulder, saying, am i not an idiot how can a fellow shoot a duck without powder and shot what's the use of this stupid wooden thing anyway and with that he flung the gun and his pouch and belt into the lake but poor fanchon was weeping at the loss of her doll and frederic was annoyed at the way things had turned out so they both crept back sadly to the house and when their mother asked them what had become of the playthings Frederic truthfully related how they had been deceived by the harper, the hunter, the doll, and all. "'Ah, oh, you foolish children!' cried their mother, half in anger. "'You do not deserve to have nice toys.' But the Count, who had been listening to Frederic's tale, said, "'Let the children alone. I am really glad that they are fairly rid of those playthings. There was something queer about them.' But neither the children nor their mother— understood what the count meant the stranger child soon after these events very early one morning fanchon and frederic ran off to the wood they were feeling sad for their mother had told them that they must return home soon to study so as to be ready for the tutor that their rich cousin had promised to send them for the tutor was expected shortly let us run and jump as much as we can now said frederic when they reached the wood for in a little while we shall not be allowed to stay out here at all so they began to play hide and seek 
but everything went wrong. The wind carried Frederick's hat into the bushes. He stumbled and fell on his nose as he was running. Fanchon found herself hanging by her clothes on a thorn tree, and she banged her foot against a sharp stone so that she shrieked with pain. In fact, the children could not understand what was the matter with them on this particular day, and they gave up their game and slunk dejectedly through the wood. Frederic threw himself down under a shady tree, and Fanchon followed his example, and there the two children lay, gloomy and wretched, gazing on the ground. "'Ah,' said Fanchon, "'if only we had our playthings.' "'Nonsense,' said Frederic. "'What should we do with them?' "'I'll tell you what it is, Fanchon. Mother is right, I suspect. The toys were good enough, but we didn't know how to play with them. If we were as learned as our rich cousins, we should be so wise that all our toys would now be whole, and we should know how to play with them rightly.' And at that Fanchon began to sob and cry bitterly, and Frederic joined her, and they both howled and lamented until the wood rang again and again. "'Oh, poor unfortunate children that we are! Oh, that we weren't as wise as our cousins!' But suddenly they both stopped crying and asked each other in amazement, "'Did you hear anything, Fanchon? Did you hear anything, Frederic? For out of the deepest shade of the dark thicket in front of the children a wonderful brightness began to shine, playing like moonlight over the leaves that trembled as if in joy, and then, through the whispering trees, came a sweet musical note, like the sound of a harp. The children lay motionless with awe. All their sorrows passed away from them, and tender happy tears rose into their eyes. As the radiance streamed brighter and brighter through the bushes, and the marvellous music grew louder and louder, the children's hearts beat high. They gazed eagerly at the brightness. Then they saw, smiling at them from the thicket, the most beautiful face of a child with the sun beaming on it in splendour. "'Oh, come to us, come to us, darling, shining child!' cried Fanchon and Frederic, stretching out their arms, and their hearts were filled with an indescribable longing. "'I am coming, I am coming!' a sweet voice cried from the bushes, and then, as if borne on the wings of the breeze, the stranger child seemed to float hovering toward Fanchon and Frederic. How the Shining Child Played with Fanchon and Frederic. "'What is the matter, dear children?' asked the stranger child. "'I heard you crying and lamenting, and I was very sorry for you. What do you want?' "'Ah,' said Frederic, "'we did not know what we wanted. But now I see that we wanted you, just you yourself.' "'That's it,' chimed in Fanchon. "'Now that you are with us we are happy again.' why were you so long in coming in fact both children felt as if they had known and played with the stranger child all their lives and that their unhappiness had been because their beloved playmate was not with them you see frederic added we have no toys left for i like a stupid dolt broke all our fine things and shied them into the thicket at this the stranger child laughed merrily and cried why fanchon and frederic you are lying this minute among the loveliest playthings that ever were seen where where are they fanchon and frederic both cried look around you said the stranger child and then fanchon and frederic saw how out of the thick grass and moss all sorts of coloured flowers were peeping with bright eyes gleaming and between them many coloured stones and crystal shells sparkled and shone while little golden insects danced up and down humming gentle songs now we will build a palace said the stranger child help me to get the stones together and it stooped down and began to pick up stones of many pretty colours. Fanchon and Frederic helped, and the stranger child placed the beautiful stones one upon another, and soon there rose tall pillars shining in the sun, while an airy golden roof stretched itself from pillar to pillar. 
then the stranger child kissed the flowers that were peeping from the grass and whispered to them lovingly and they shot up higher and higher and twining together formed sweet-scented arbors and covered walks in which the children danced about full of delight and gladness the stranger child clapped its hands and immediately the golden roof that was made of insects golden wings fell to pieces with a hum and the pillars melted away into a splashing silver stream on whose banks flowers grew and peeped into the water then the stranger child plucked little blades of grass and gathered twigs from trees strewing them on the ground before fanchon and frederic the blades of grass turned into the prettiest little live dolls ever seen and the twigs became gay little huntsmen the dolls danced around fanchon and let her take them into her lap and they whispered in such delicate little voices be kind to us love us dear fanchon the huntsmen shouted halloa halloa the hunt is up and blew their horns and bustled about then tiny hares came darting out of the bushes with tiny dogs after them and the huntsmen pursued them with shouts this was delightful then suddenly these wonders disappeared and fanchon and frederic cried out what has become of the dolls where are the huntsmen the stranger child answered oh they are always here waiting for you they are close beside you so you may have them at any minute but just now would you not rather go with me through the wood oh yes yes cried fanchon and frederic the stranger child took hold of their hands crying come come and with that off they went the children felt themselves floating along lightly and easily through the trees while all the birds flew fluttering beside them singing and warbling their sweetest songs and then suddenly they soared into the air higher and higher they mounted like birds skimming above the tops of the trees frederic shouted with delight but fanchon was frightened oh my breath is going i shall tumble she cried and just at that moment the stranger child let them gently to the ground and said now i shall sound my forest song then good-bye for to-day and the stranger child took out a little horn of wreathed gold and began to sound it so beautifully that the whole wood re-echoed wondrously with its lovely music while a host of nightingales came flocking to the branches above the children's heads and sang their most melodious songs but all at once the music grew fainter and fainter and only a soft whispering seemed to come from the thicket into which the stranger child had vanished to-morrow to-morrow i will come again the children heard breathe gently as if from a distance then they sighed with joy for though they could not understand it never had they known such happiness in all their lives oh i wish it was to-morrow now they both cried as they hastened home to their parents how the forest talked to fanchon and frederic i should fancy that the children had dreamed all this said the count to his wife when fanchon and frederic who could think of nothing else but the stranger child and the wonderful events and the exquisite music had told all that had happened i should fancy that they had dreamed all this if they had not both seen the same things i cannot get to the bottom of it all don't bother your head about it my dear answered his wife i think this stranger child was nobody but the schoolmaster's son from the village we must take care that he is not allowed to put any more such nonsense into the children's heads but the count did not agree with her for he called the children to him again to tell how the stranger child was dressed and looked fanchon and frederic both agreed that its face was fair as lilies that it had cheeks like roses cherry lips bright blue eyes and locks of gold and that it was more beautiful than words could tell but what they said about its dress sounded absurd for Fanchon said that its dress was wondrous, beautiful, shining, and gleaming, as if made of the petals of flowers, while Frederic insisted that its garments were of sparkling golden green, like spring leaves in the sunshine. And Frederic thought the stranger child was a boy, while Fanchon was sure that it was a girl. 
and these contradictions confused their parents, and the Count shook his head wonderingly. The next day Fanchon and Frederic hastened to the wood, and found the stranger child waiting for them. If their play had been glorious the day before, it was ten times more glorious to-day, for the stranger child did such marvellous things that Fanchon and Frederic shouted for joy. While they played, the stranger child talked sweetly to the trees, flowers, and birds, and to the brook that ran through the wood, and they all answered so clearly that Fanchon and Frederic understood everything they said. "'Dear children,' cried the alder thicket, "'why were you not here early when my friend the morning breeze came rustling over the blue hills, and brought us thousands of greetings and kisses from the golden queen of the dawn, and plenty of wing-waftings full of sweet perfumes?' oh silence the flowers broke in do not mention that robber the morning breeze does he not steal our perfumes never mind the alders children let them lisp and whisper listen to us we love you so we dress ourselves in the loveliest colours just for you and do we not love you beautiful flowers said the stranger child tenderly but Fanchon knelt down on the grass, and stretched out her arms as if she would take all the bright flowers to her heart, and cried, "'Oh, I love you! I love you, every one!' Then came a sighing out of the tall, dark fir-trees, and they said, "'We shade the flowers from the hot sun, and shelter human children when the storm comes rushing through the woods, but who loves us in return?' groan and sigh cried frederic and murmur as much as you like you green giants that you are it is then that the real woodsman's heart rejoices in you i love all the green bushes the flowers and you trees you are quite right splashed the brook as it sparkled over its stones come sit down amongst this moss dear children and listen to me i come from afar out of a deep cool dark rock i gush look into my waves and i will show you the loveliest pictures in my clear mirror the blue of the sky the fleecy clouds bushes trees and blossoms and your very selves dear children i draw tenderly into my transparent bosom fanchon and frederic said the stranger child looking around with wondrous blissfulness only listen how they all love us but the redness of evening is rising behind the hills and the nightingale is calling me home "'Oh, but first let us fly a little, as we did yesterday,' begged Frederic. "'Yes,' said Fanchon, "'but not quite so high. It makes my head giddy.' Then the stranger child took them each by the hand again, and they went soaring up into the golden purple of the evening sky, while the birds crowded and sang around them. Among the shining clouds Frederic saw, as if in a wavering flame, beautiful castles, all of rubies and other precious stones. "'Look! Look, Fanchon!' he cried, full of rapture. "'Look at those splendid palaces! Let us fly along as fast as we can, and we shall soon get to them!' Fanchon, too, saw the castles, and forgot her fear, and kept looking upward. "'Those are my beloved castles in the air,' the stranger child said. "'But we must go no farther to-day.' Fanchon and Frederic seemed to be in a dream, and could not make out how they suddenly came to find themselves with their father and mother. THE PALACE OF THE FAIRY QUEEN It was the next day, in the most beautiful part of the wood beside the brook, between whispering bushes, the stranger child had set up a glorious tent made of tall slender lilies, glowing roses, and tulips of every hue, and beneath this tent Fanchon and Frederic were seated with the stranger child, listening to the forest brook as it whirled and rippled and sang its wonderful stories. "'Tell us,' said Fanchon, "'darling, shining child, where your home is, and all about your father and mother.' The stranger child looked sorrowfully at the sky. "'Ah, oh, my dear,' it said with a sigh, "'is it not enough that I come to you each day? Why must you then ask about my home? Though you were to travel day after day, forever and ever, even to beyond the utmost range of the purple hills, you could not reach it. Ah, me, sighed Fanchon. 
then you must live hundreds and hundreds of miles away from us. Is it only on a visit that you are here? Fanchon, beloved, said the stranger child, whenever you long for me with all your heart, I am with you immediately, bringing you all those plays and wonders. Is that not as good as being in my home? Not at all, said Frederick, for I believe that you live in a most glorious place. I do not care how hard the road is to your home. I mean to set out this minute for it. And so you shall, said the stranger child, smiling. For when you see all this so clearly before you, and make up your mind to be there, it is as good as done. The land where I live, in truth, is so beautiful and glorious that I can give you no description of it. It is my mother who reigns over that land, all glory and loveliness, as queen. Ah, you are a prince, cried Frederic. Ah, you are a princess, cried Fanchon. I certainly am, said the stranger child. My mother's palace is far more beautiful than those glittering castles you saw in the evening clouds, for the gleaming pillars of her palace are of the purest crystal and they soar slender and tall into the blue of heaven. Upon them rests a great wide blue canopy. Beneath the canopy sail the shining white clouds hither and thither on golden wings, and the red of the evening and the morning rises and falls, and the sparkling stars dance in a singing circle around her palace. You have heard of the fairies who can bring about great wonders. My mother is queen of the fairies. Very often she holds a feast for little children. It is then that the elves belonging to my mother's kingdom fly through the air, weaving shining rainbows from one end of her palace to the other. Under these rainbows they build my mother's diamond throne, that in appearance and perfume is like lilies, roses, and carnations. My mother takes her place upon the throne, and the elves sing and play on golden harps. As soon as their music begins, everything in the palace, in the woods and gardens, moves and sings. And all around there are thousands of beautiful little children in charming dresses, shouting with delight. The children chase each other amongst the golden trees and throw blossoms at each other. They climb the trees where the wind swings and rocks them. They gather gold glittering fruit, and they play with tame deer and other gentle wild creatures that come bounding up to them and lick their hands. Then the children run up and down the rainbows, or they ride on the backs of great purple birds that fly up among the gleaming clouds. "'How delightful that must be!' cried Fanchon and Frederic with rapture. "'Oh, take us with you to your home, beautiful shining child. We want to stay there always.' "'That may not be,' said the stranger child, and Fanchon and Frederic cast down their eyes sadly to the ground. THE WICKED MOOSH "'Ah,' said the stranger child, you might not be so happy at my mother's court. Indeed, it would be a great misfortune for you to try to go to her kingdom. There are many children who cannot bear the singing of the purple birds, and if they hear their songs, they die. Then, too, destruction might overtake you before you could reach my mother's court. Even I am not safe on my way thither. There was a time when I was safe anywhere. But now a bitter enemy of my mother, whom she banished from her kingdom, goes raging about the world, and I cannot be safe from being watched, pursued, and molested. Powerless as this bitter enemy is when I am at home, nothing can protect me from him when I am flying abroad. "'What sort of a hateful creature is it?' asked Fanchon, "'that can do you so much harm?' "'I have told you.' said the stranger child, that my mother is the fairy queen. Among her many elves are some who hover in the sky or dwell in the waters, and others who serve at the fairy court. Once, long ago, there came among us, those that served at court, a stranger who called himself Papillon. He said that he was learned in all the sciences of the world and could accomplish great things among us. My mother made him Prime Minister. 
Papillon soon showed his natural spite and wickedness. He pretended to the queen that he loved children and could make them very happy. But instead of doing so, he hung himself like a weight of lead on the tails of the purple birds so that they could not fly aloft and when the children climbed the rose trees he dragged them down by the legs then he knocked their noses on the ground and made them bleed when the children sang he crammed all sorts of nasty stuff down their throats for sweet and happy singing he could not abide and worst of all he had a way of smearing the sparkling precious stones of the palace and the lilies and roses and even the shining rainbows with a horrible black juice so that everything beautiful became sorrowful or dead. And when he had done all this, he gave a loud hissing laugh and said that everything was now as he wished it to be. Then, shouting that he was greater than my mother, he went flying up into the air in the shape of an enormous fly with flashing eyes and a long snout, after which he went humming and buzzing around my mother's throne in a most abominable fashion. When the queen, my mother, and her elves saw this, they knew that he had come among them under a false name, and that he was none other than Moosh the gloomy king of the gnomes. The entire fairy court thereupon rushed against him, beating him with their wings, while the purple birds seized him with their glittering beaks and gripped him so tightly that he screamed with agony and rage, after which the birds shook him violently and threw him down to the earth. He fell straight onto the back of his old aunt, who was a great blue toad, and she carried him off to her hole but five hundred of the children in the fairy court armed themselves with fly-flappers to defend themselves against the moosh, should he ever venture to return. Now after he was gone, all the black juice disappeared, and everything became as shining and glorious as before. So you see, dear children, continued the stranger child, what kind of creature I have to fear this horrible moosh follows me about and if i did not hide myself quickly he would injure me and i assure you that if i were to take you with me to my home moosh would lie in wait for us and kill us fanchon wept bitterly at the danger to which the stranger child was exposed but frederic said if that horrible moosh is nothing but a great fly i'll soon hit him with father's big fly flapper and if once I give him a good crack on his nose, Auntie Blue Toad will have a job carrying him to her hole again. How Tutor Ink Arrived to Teach the Children Fanchon and Frederic ran home as fast as they could, shouting as they went, Oh, the shining child is a beautiful princess! Oh, the shining child is a beautiful prince! They wanted, in their delight, to tell this to their parents, but their father came to meet them with a most extraordinary man walking by his side. This stranger kept muttering to himself, "'What a nice pair of stupids these are! Ha! <laughs> ah. The Count took him by the hand and said to the children, "'This gentleman is the tutor whom your kind cousin has sent to teach you. So now shake hands with him and bid him welcome.' But the children looked sideways at him, and could move neither hand nor foot. This was because they had never seen such an extraordinary being. He was no taller than Frederick. His body was round and bloated, and his little weazen legs could hardly support its weight. His head was queer and square, and his eyes too ugly for anything for not only was his nose long and pointed, but his little bulging eyes glittered and his wide mouth was open in a ferocious way. He was clad in black from top to toe, and his name was Tutor Ink. Now as the children stood staring like stone images, their mother cried angrily, "'You rude children! What are you thinking of? Come, come, give the tutor your hands!' The children, taking heart, did as their mother bade them, but as soon as Tutor Ink took hold of their hands, they jumped back, screaming, "'Oh! Oh! That hurts!' The tutor laughed aloud and showed a needle, which he had hidden in his hand, to prick the children with. Fanchon was weeping, but Frederick growled, "'Just try that again, little big body, if you dare!' 
"'Why did you do that, Tutor Ink? asked the Count, somewhat annoyed. "'Well, it's just my way,' answered Tutor Ink. "'I can't alter it.' And with that he stuck his hands to his sides and went on laughing until his voice sounded like the noise of a broken rattle. Alas! After that there was no more running about in the wood. Instead the children, day after day, had to sit in the house, repeating after Tutor Ink strange gibberish, not one word of which they could understand. With what longing eyes they looked at the wood! Often they thought they heard, amidst the happy songs of the birds and the rustling of the trees, the voice of the stranger child, calling and calling, Fanchon! Frederic! Are you not coming to play with me? Oh, come! I have made you a palace all of flowers. We will play there, and I will give you all sorts of beautiful stones, and then we'll fly through the air and build cloud castles. Come! Oh, come! At this the children's thoughts were so drawn to the wood that they neither heard nor saw their tutor any longer, although he thumped on the table with both fists and hummed and growled and snarled. At last one day the Count perceived how pale the children were getting, and bade Tutor Ink take them for a walk. The tutor did not like the idea at all, and the children did not like it either, saying, "'What business has Tutor Ink?' in our darling wood. What happened when Tutor Ink took the children to the wood? "'Well, Tutor Ink, is it not delightful here in our wood?' asked Frederick. Tutor Ink made a face and muttered stupid nonsense. "'All one does is tear his stockings. One can't hear a word because of the abominable screeching of all the birds.' "'But surely you love the flowers,' Fanchon chimed in. At this Tutor Ink's face became a deep cherry color, and he beat his hands about him, crying, "'Stupid nonsense! Ridiculous nonsense! There are no decent flowers in this wood!' "'But don't you see those dear little lilies of the valley peeping up at you with such bright loving eyes?' asked Fanchon. "'What? What?' the tutor screamed. "'Flowers! Eyes! <laughs> nice eyes! Useless things!' And with that he stooped, and plucking up a handful of the lilies, roots and all, threw them into the thicket. Fanchon could not help shedding bitter tears, and Frederic gnashed his teeth in anger. Just then a little robin alighted on a branch near the tutor's head, and began to sing sweetly. The tutor, picking up a stone, threw it, and the bird fell dying to the ground. Frederic could restrain himself no longer. "'You horrible tutor, Ink!' he cried. "'What did the little bird do to you that you should strike it dead?' And looking toward the thicket, he called sadly, "'Oh, where are you, beautiful shining child? Oh, come, only come. Let us fly far, far away. I cannot stay beside this horrible creature any longer.' And Fanchon, stretching out her hands, sobbed and wept bitterly. "'Oh, you darling, shining child!' she cried. "'Come to us! Come to us! Save us! Save us! Tutor Ink is killing us, as he is killing the flowers and birds!' "'What do you mean by the shining child?' snarled Tutor Ink. But at that instant there was a loud whispering and rustling in the thicket, and a sound as of muffled drums tolling in the distance. Then the children saw, in a shining cloud that floated above them, the beautiful face of the stranger child, and tears like glittering pearls were rolling down its rosy cheeks. "'Ah, oh, my darling playmates,' it cried, "'I cannot come to you any more. Farewell, farewell.' The no moosh has you in his power, oh, you poor children. Good-bye, good-bye. And then the stranger child soared up far into the clouds, and the most marvelous thing happened. Behind the children there began a most horrid, fearsome buzzing and humming, snarling and growling, and, lo, Tutor Ink had changed into an enormous, frightful-looking fly, and he began to fly upward heavily, following the stranger child. Fanchon and Frederic, overpowered with terror, ran out of the wood and did not dare look up at the sky until they had gotten some distance away, and then, when they did so, all that they could see was a shining speck in the clouds, 
glittering like a star, coming nearer and downward. The star grew bigger and bigger, and the children could hear as if it were the call of a trumpet, and presently they saw that the star was really a splendid bird with shining purple plumage. It came dropping down to the wood, clapping its mighty wings, singing loud and clear. "'Hurrah! hurrah!' shouted Frederick. "'That is a purple bird from the fairy court. He will bite Tutor Ink to death. The shining child is saved, and so are we.' come fanchon let us get home as fast as we can and tell our father about it what the count did to tutor ink the children burst into the house where their parents were sitting hurrah hurrah frederick shouted the purple bird has bitten tutor ink to death oh father dear mother dear cried fanchon tutor ink is not tutor ink at all he is really the wicked mouche king of the gnomes a monstrous fly but a fly with clothes and shoes and stockings on who on earth has been putting such nonsense into your heads asked the countess and the parents gazed at the children in utter amazement while they went so oh, to tell about the stranger child whose mother was a great fairy queen and about the gnome king mouche and the purple bird the count grew very grave and thoughtful frederic said he you are really a sensible boy and i must admit that tutor ink has always seemed to me a strange mysterious creature your mother and i are by no means satisfied with him particularly your mother he has such a terrible sweet tooth and there is no way of keeping him from the sugar and jams and then he hums and buzzes in such a distressing manner but in spite of all this my dear boy just think calmly for a minute even if there are such things as gnomes in the world do you really mean to say that your tutor has become a fly frederic looked his father steadily in the face with his clear blue eyes and said i should not have believed it myself if the stranger child had not said so and if i had not seen it with my own eyes that he is only a horrible fly and pretends to be tutor ink and then continued frederic while his father shook his head in wonder see what mother says about him is he not ravenous for sweet things is that not just like a fly and then his hummings and buzzings silence cried the count whatever tutor ink is one thing is certain the purple bird has not bitten him to death for there he comes out of the wood at this the children uttered loud screams and rushed behind the door in truth tutor ink was approaching but he was wild-looking and bewildered he was buzzing and humming and springing high in the air first to one side then to the other banging his head against the trees he tumbled into the house and dashed at the milk jug and popped his head into it so that the milk ran over the sides then he gulped and gulped making a horrid noise of swallowing what ails you tutor ink cried the countess what are you about are you out of your senses asked the count is the foul fiend after you but without making any answer tutor ink taking his mouth from the milk jug threw himself down on the dish of butter and began to lick it with his pointed tongue and then with a loud buzzing he sprang off the table and began to stagger hither and thither about the room as though he were drunk this is a pretty behavior cried the count as he tried to seize tutor ink by the coat-tails but tutor ink managed to elude him deftly just then frederic came running up with his father's big fly flapper in his hand and gave it to the count crying here you are father knock the terrible moosh to death the count took the fly flapper and then they all set to work to drive away tutor ink fanchon and frederic and their mother took table napkins and made sweeps with them in the air driving the tutor backward and forward here and there while the count kept striking at him with the fly flapper wilder and wilder grew the chase hum hum and sum sum went the tutor storming hither and thither flip flap and clip clap went the table napkins and fly flapper at last the count managed to hit the tutor's coat-tails. Then, just as the count was going to strike a second time, up bounced the tutor into the air, and with renewed strength stormed, humming and buzzing out of the door and away among the trees. 
"'Well done!' exclaimed the Count. "'We are rid of that abominable tutor ink. "'Never shall he cross my threshold again.' "'How the Naughty Playthings Became Alive Fanchon and Frederic now breathed freely once more. A great weight was taken off their hearts. They rejoiced that now, since the wicked Mouche was gone, the stranger child might come back. They hurried to the wood. Everything was silent and deserted. Not a merry note of a single bird was there. Instead of the joyous singing of the brook and the gladsome rustling of the leaves, they seemed to hear sighs and moans that passed through the air. Just then, close behind them, snarling voices cried out, "'Stupid creatures! Senseless creatures! You despised us! You did not know how to treat us! We are come back to punish you!' Fanchon and Frederic looked around, and saw the little hunter and the harper rise out of the thicket. The harper twanged his tiny harp while the hunter took aim at Frederic, and both cried out, "'Wait, you boy and girl! We are obedient servants of Tutor Inc. He will be here in a minute, and then we'll pay you well for despising us.' Terrified, the children turned to run away when the doll rose up out of the thicket and squeaked out, "'Stupid creatures! Senseless creatures! I am an obedient servant of Tutor Inc. He will be here in a moment, and then I'll pay you well for despising me.' And with that the naughty creatures sent great splashes of muddy water flying at Fanchon and Frederic, so that they were quite wet. Then the children fell on their knees, sobbing, "'Oh, how unfortunate we are! Will no one take pity on us?' Scarcely had they said thus when the playthings disappeared. The rushing of the brook turned to the sweetest music. All the wood streamed with a wonderful sparkling light, and lo, the stranger child came forth from the thicket surrounded by such brilliant rays that Fanchon and Frederic had to shut their eyes for a minute. Then they felt themselves touched gently, and the stranger child's sweet voice said, Oh, do not mourn for me, dear playmates, though you will not see me again. Still I shall be near you. Neither the wicked Mouche nor any other gnome shall have power to harm you. Only go on loving me faithfully. That we shall, that we shall, dear shining child, the children cried. We love you with all our hearts. And at last, when they could open their eyes, the stranger child had vanished, and all their grief and fear were gone too. Delight beamed in their eyes and shone in their cheeks. And what the stranger child had said came to pass. Nothing ever harmed Fanchon and Frederic. They grew up handsome, clever, and sweet-tempered, and all that they undertook prospered. And as the years went on, they still, in their dreams, played with the stranger child, who never ceased to bring them the loveliest things from its fairy home. End of chapter 73 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 74 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott Mabel on Midsummer Day A Story of the Olden Time, Part 1 Arise, my maiden Mabel, the mother said, arise, for the golden sun of midsummer is shining in the skies arise my little maiden for thou must speed away to wait upon thy grandmother this live long summer day and thou must carry with thee this wheaten cake so fine this new-made pat of butter this little flask of wine and tell the dear old body this day i cannot come for the good man went out yestermorn and he has not come home and more than this poor amy Upon my knee doth lie, I fear me, with this fever pain, the little child will die. 
and thou canst help thy grandmother the table thou canst spread canst feed the little dog and bird and thou canst make her bed and thou canst fetch the water from the lady well hard by and thou canst gather from the wood the faggots brown and dry canst go down to the lonesome glen to milk the mother you this is the work my mabel that thou wilt have to do but listen now my mabel this is midsummer day when all the fairy people from elfland come away and when thou'rt in the lonesome glen keep by the running burn and do not pluck the strawberry flower nor break the lady fern but think not of the fairy folk lest mischief should befall think only of poor amy and how thou lovest us all yet to keep good heart my mabel if thou the fairies see and give them kindly answer if they should speak to thee and when into the firwood thou ghost for faggots brown do not like idle children go wandering up and down but fill thy little apron my child with earnest speed and that thou break no living bough within the wood take heed for they are spiteful brownies who in the wood abide so be thou careful of this thing lest evil should betide but think not little mabel whilst thou art in the wood of dwarfish wilful brownies but of the father good and when thou goest to the spring to fetch the water thence do not disturb the little stream lest this should give offence for the queen of all the fairies she loves that water bright i've seen her drinking there myself on many a summer night but she's a gracious lady and her thou needst not fear only disturb thou not the stream nor spill the water clear now all this i will heed mother will no word disobey and wait upon the grandmother this live-long summer day part two away trip little mabel with a wheaten cake so fine with a new-made pat of butter and the little flask of wine and long before the sun was hot and the summer mist had cleared beside the good old grandmother the willing child appeared in all her mother's message she told with right good will how that the father was away and the little child was ill and then she swept the hearth up clean and then the table spread and next she fed the dog and bird and then she made the bed and go now said the grandmother ten paces down the dell and bring in water for the day thou know'st the lady well the first time that good mabel went nothing at all saw she except a bird a sky-blue bird that sat upon a tree the next time that good mabel went there sat a lady bright beside the well a lady small all clothed in green and white a curtsy low made mabel and then she stooped to fill her pitcher at the sparkling spring but no drop did she spill thou art a handy maiden the fairy lady said thou hast not spilled a drop nor yet the fairy spring trouble led and for this thing which thou hast done yet mayst not understand i give to thee a better gift than houses or than land thou shalt do well whate'er thou dost as thou hast done this day shalt have the will and power to please and shalt be loved alway thus having said she passed from sight and naught could mabel see but the little bird the sky-blue bird upon the leafy tree part three and now go said the grandmother and fetch and faggots dry all in the neighbouring firwood beneath the trees they lie away went kind good mabel into the firwood near where all the ground was dry and brown and the grass grew thin and sear she did not wander up and down nor yet a live branch pull but steadily of the fallen boughs she picked her apron full and when the wild wood brownies came sliding to her mind she drove them thence as she was told with home thoughts sweet and kind but all that while the brownies within the fir wood still they watched her how she picked the wood and strove to do no ill and oh but she is small and neat said one twere shame to spite a creature so demure and meek a creature harmless quite look only said another 
at her little gown of blue at her kerchief pinned about her head and at her little shoe oh but she is a comely child said a third and we will lay a good luck penny in her path a boon for her this day seeing she broke no living wood no live thing did affray with that the smallest penny of the finest silver ore upon the dry and slippery path lay mabel's feet before with joy she picked the penny up the fairy penny good and with her faggots dry and brown went wandering from the wood now she has that said the brownies let flax be ever so dear twill buy her clothes of the very best for many and many a year part four and go now said the grandmother since falling is the dew go down into the lonesome glen and milk the mother ewe all down into the lonesome glen through copses thick and wild through moist rank grass by trickling streams went on the willing child and when she came to the lonesome glen she kept beside the burn and neither plucked the strawberry flower nor broke the lady fern and while she milked the mother ewe within this lonesome glen she wished that little amy were strong and well again and soon as she had thought this thought she heard a coming sound as if a thousand fairy folk were gathering all around and then she heard a little voice shrill as the midge's wing that spake aloud a human child is here yet mark this thing the lady fern is all unbroke the strawberry flower unto n what shall be done for her who still from mischief can refrain give her a fairy cake said one grant her a wish said three the latest wish that she hath wished said all what e'er it be kind mabel heard the words they spake and from the lonesome glen unto the good old grandmother went gladly back again thus happened it to mabel on that midsummer day and these three fairy blessings she took with her away tis good to make all duty sweet to be alert and kind tis good like little mabel to have a willing mind mary howitt End of Mabel on Midsummer Day Chapter 75 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Oh, where do the fairies hide their heads? Oh, where do fairies hide their heads when snow lies on the hills, when frost has spoiled their mossy beds and crystallized their rills? Beneath the moon they cannot trip in circles o'er the plain, in draughts of dew they cannot sip till green leaves come again when they return there will be mirth and music in the air and fairy wings upon the earth and mischief everywhere the maids to keep the elves aloof will bar the doors in vain no keyhole will be fairy proof when green leaves come again thomas haynes bailey end of oh where do fairies hide their heads Chapter seventy six of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott the fairy's passage one tap 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 rap get up gaffer fairy man ah who is there clock strikes three get up do gaffer you are the very man we have been long long longing to see 
the ferryman rises growling and grumbling and goes fum fumbling and stumbling and tumbling over the wares and his way to the door but he sees no more than he saw before till a voice is heard o oh, ferryman dear here we are waiting all of us here we are we we colony we some two hundred and all or three ferry us over the river lee ere dawn of day and we will pay the most we may in our own wee way two who are you whence came you what place are you going to oh we have dwelt over long in this land the people get cross and are growing so knowing too nothing at all but they now understand we are daily vanishing under the thunder of some huge engine or iron wonder that iron ah it has entered our souls your souls oh goals you queer little drolls do you mean good gaffer do aid us with speed for our time like our stature is short indeed and a very long way we have to go eight or ten thousand miles or so hither and thither and to and fro with our pots and pans and little gold cans but our light caravans run swifter than man's three well well you may come said the ferryman affably patrick turn out and get ready the barge then again to the little folk though you seem laughably small i don't mind if your coppers be large oh dear what a rushing what pushing what crushing the watermen making vain efforts at hushing the hubbub the while there followed these words what clapping of boards what strapping of cords what stowing away of children and wives and platters and mugs and spoons and knives till all had safely got into the boat and the ferryman clad in his tip-top coat and his wee little fairies were safely afloat then ding 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 and cling 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 how the coppers did ring in the tin pitcherling four off then went the boat at first very pleasantly smoothly and so forth but after a while it swayed and it swaggered this and that way and presently chest after chest and pile after pile of the little folks goods began tossing and rolling and pitching like fun beyond fairy controlling oh mab if the hubbub were great before it was now some two or three million times more crash went the wee crocks and the clocks and the locks of each little wee box were strove in by hard knocks and then there were oaths and prayers and cries take care see there oh dear my eyes i am killed i am drowned with groans and sighs to land they drew ye ho pull to till a rope through and through and all rights anew five now jump upon shore ye queer little oddities eh what is this where are they at all where are they and where are their tiny commodities well as i live he looks blank as a wall poor ferryman round him and round him he gazes but only gets deeplier lost in the mazes of utter bewilderment all all are gone and he stands alone like a statue of stone in a doldrum of wonder he turns to steer and a tinkling laugh salutes his ear with other odd sounds ha 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 fo lol zid ziddle quee quee ba ba fizz ig gig gig giddy fee see sha sha o oh, ye thieves ye thieves ye rascally thieves the good man cries he turns to his pitcher and there alas to his horror perceives that the little folk's mode of making him richer has been to pay him with withered leaves james clarence magan end of the fairy's passage chapter seventy seven of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Old Winter's Fairyland. To Winter. Sooth tis, old friend, thou banishest the golden rest of the hours, dost cruelly send the birds off, and the twinkling band of the flowers, dost lash the shadows out of the woods, and kill the souls in the plunging floods. Thou chillest the green, and it departs into the hearts of the mees, and dreams of sheen, grasses and leaves, blossoms and sheaves, and of trees. Thou foldest all colors up in mold, and touchest the aching light with cold. There is no bloom of vanished wold, inlaid with gold, but blends and heights in bloom in shadowing woods and tumbling floods and plains of summer in the core of the world and golden skies are there unfurled the fairies keep a revel there and banish care with mirth when snows are deep and woods are cross and joy are loss in the earth the leaves and grass and water springs the glorious world with its living things each happy thought that goes on wings and sings or thinks itself in blossomings of red and gold all bless the cold that ruleth with an iron hand to build in the earth a fairyland at christmas tide on country farms and games and charms thou thrivest by deep hearth side when tales are told and songs are trolled as through the mould thou drivest the shuddering flowers thou dost begin to gather us up and drive us in for all whom care or labor drew from old to new in the year thou dost prepare the roaring hearth and garrulous mirth and beer and massy cans to season it nut brown and livelier than thy wit the yule log sends its light abroad o'er roof and board and cheerily in shade ascends the cricket's song the winds are strong and drearily shrill past the rattling window panes and down the wide mouth chimney shriek and moan the hind drops in from fold and pen and graver men from labors and maids who spin and catch perchance with smiling glance their neighbors the dame is there and reverend sire and children clustering round the fire they quaff their ale their pipes they fill and he who has skill in numbers prolongs the tale the wheel goes round with a drowsy sound and slumbers the humming stoop goes round and round till their heads go round as the wheel goes round and sleep and silence go there round and the fairy summer underground blooms all night long in sleep till morning buds and blossoms without a sound anonymous end of old winter's fairyland end of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott.